science is a precision process. It's, it's very precise. And I mean, this is why they have so much terminology in science, because they're like really precisely trying to define everything. Uh, and in the new age, we get a bit hand wavy, right? And um, loosely using terms. And that becomes problematic. I mean, it might sound fancy and might get, it might get in the mass consciousness, which is great, but then there's a misunderstanding of what it really means, which then doesn't serve people. Uh, and that's when scientists, tend, you know, traditional scientists tend to just say, it's all oh, that's pseudoscience. And they just kind of wave it away because they also have their own intellectual elitism, if you will, around what is an acceptable use of, of scientific terminology and what's not. So I like to, you know, find that middle path, if you will, that we can explore into the metaphysical with this. And I think even, even Nikola Tesla said that the day that science begins to explore non-physical phenomenon It'll, you know, make more progress in one decade than it has in all the previous centuries of, of the scientific um, method. And, and so we're, we're kind of coming to that bridge point right now. And I think from a, um, the perspective of where the New Age is, has gone, it's, it's gotten too loosey-goosey, right? Too airy-fairy, if you will. And it, 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 it's too... Im- I don't I don't want to offend anyone but is there's like too much image oriented stuff like sure. if you sound really cool and if you got the latest greatest buzzwords you know then then you've got the the you're you're the in person right yeah it's a new wardrobe it's a new identity structure to kind of again like our ego is so slippery and how it can use anything to build a sense of superiority that's one aspect of it but then there's also just the genus the, the genuine innocent uh misunderstanding of right. these things, right? Well, and sometimes people feel really good about themselves because they've got the concepts um, and they wear that identity badge, if you will, but they aren't living it. You know, they're, they're not embodying it. And there's a huge difference between having knowledge of something or a concept about something and having understanding about something. I think that this is where we need to evolve. We need to shift from just concepts and knowledge and, and identity badges, you know, because believe some certain things and yet not live it, right? The difference between knowledge and understanding is you're living it, right? And to get to understanding, you have to apply it. You have to take it into action. You have to test it out against the world in your life. You have to live it and embody it. And once you've like really come to a place of embodying that concept and living it in your life and, and not just talking a good talk, but walking the talk, if you will, then you really know. And then you can be somebody who can share that with others. But if you just have a concept and you try to be somebody who shares it with others, you don't know what you're talking about. You're just trying to sound fancy. Uh, and so th- we do have this, unfortunately, in the world today. There's a lot of, you know, people who claim to have the, the knowledge and the answers, but they're just using the buzzword. Yeah. Um, but there are also really genuine um, teachers out there who have the understanding. But I find that to, to really come to a place of understanding, you have to do the work. And a lot of people don't really want to do the work. And that's, that's really where you start to um, figure out if somebody's just going to stay kind of fluffy about things or if they're really going to make progress in their life. And to me, uh, with the people I work with, I want to work with people who really want to make progress. They actually want to take these tools into application and, and live it and embody it and really come to understand it versus just know about it. Yeah. Yeah, Meister Eckhart, I remember saying something like scientists may disagree to infinitum, but, you know, mystics of the world speak the same language uh, because reality can actually only be experienced intrinsically. Like we can, of course, know aspects of it through the rational, logical mind, um, but through the embodied experience Mm -hmm. of such concepts, does one actually begin to even know something? The rest of it actually isn't knowledge. It's, it's, it's it's not really a gnosis Mm -hmm. as a, as a better, better word there. And so to make this fruitful for anybody who's listening, because I'm sure we've all fallen in traps of, you know, doing this. um, And anytime we critique something, I would love to kind of help replace the bad habit. What's an example of like language that's used out of its context that you would love to see a little bit more refinement with, um, that you kind of tend to see often. Could you, and, and yeah, how would, how would you remedy that? Okay. So one example that I hear is, um, you know, when people say it's all energy, therefore it's all quantum. Uh, have you heard that before? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So when we say it's all energy, that's actually not a quantum view. 
that's uh, that goes back to Einstein, right? E equals mc squared. Everything is energy, matter. You know, it's all energy. But that's actually a classical paradigm. Um, in the quantum view, energy is an epiphenomenon that emerges out of the quantum. Uh, so is time. So is space. So is matter. Right. So time, space, matter, energy, all these things that are in the phenomenological world, they're they're Newtonian, if you will. They're classical. Um, but in the quantum, it's all information, possibilities, potentialities, um, but nothing actualized. And energy is an actualized form. So that's one sort of, so we can, in quantum physics, we talk a lot about information and we talk about wave functions, but wave functions are about possibilities and probabilities. Uh, they're not about actuality or energy even. Um, and there is this like bubbling sea of, you know, it's constantly in movement. Like there is like a vibration to it, but it's not a physical vibration. It's a potentiality vibration. Uh, so there's, a, there's a subtle shift there that, that can happen. Um, uh, another example, you know, I, I heard somebody saying recently, like, you know, if we're, if we're really grounded, could you say that we've collapsed our waveform into presence? It's like, <laughs> I, that sounds really sounds cool, nice. but I don't know what that means. You know, as a physicist, it's like, what do you mean? You know, it's, so it's like taking these fancy words and putting them together in something that sounds cool and it makes you look good, but it doesn't really mean anything. Um, and so th this is about really understanding more the true definitions of things. You know, I think that it starts by really digging in to, to understand what does that really mean? Um, and is this the proper context to be using that term or am I just, you know, hand waving with uh, my use of it to sound cool? Yeah. And part to blame is the education system in which has uh, raised us in a sense to like memorize facts as a form of intellectual knowledge instead of uh, following our deep innate curiosities to truly understand what something is, what something means. And therefore, when we use it, we can just approach these areas with humility um, and speak from what we know instead of speaking from uh, what we wish to sound like we know, in a sense. You know, there's there's a, a teacher in the, the mystery school that I study with, the modern mystery school, who's got a great way of um, putting that. And he says, you cannot share what you do not have. Hmm. And if you don't have true understanding of what it is you're talking about, you can't share understanding with anybody. Right. So you got to first make sure you've got it before you start professing it. And uh, that doesn't mean we have to be perfect. Course, right. Because yeah. I also am a firm believer that you're going to master something by helping, you know, serve with it in some way or, or teach in some way. Um, and, and then through the reflection of the people you're working with, you're going to learn more and you're going to advance your knowledge. And in fact, you can't master something until you've served with it. You have to take it into service so that it goes beyond just you and your relationship with it. And you can then see how it applies to other people. Uh, and, and so for me, like the, the fastest path to coming to know thyself is actually a path of, of serving other people and helping them to come, you know, to come to know thyself. And the more I help others come to know thyself, the more I come to know myself. And, you know, it's, it's this reciprocal kind of thing that happens because we're all connected. And, and the more we, we really, uh, work with that from a place of humility, as you're saying, you know, that it's not about me. It's not about my ego. It's not about whether I'm like, it's not about how popular I am. Uh, it's not about any of that. Like I got to take the me out of the equation in a way and just serve, you know, because I want to make a difference or because the world needs, you know, to become a better place. And it's about something much bigger than just the individual. Yeah. It really feels like our own specialness or uniqueness gets born out of actually the letting go of the need to be perceived as unique and special mm -hmm. you know it's in that then like authenticity radiates and you know authenticity definitely has gotten a big pr agent over the past couple decades so it's a trendy term but like the lack of agenda internally i feel like allows for genuine connection both between you and other human beings but also you and what you're here to be doing mm -hmm.